What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, your favorite dynasty show brought to you by Big Dogs Gotta Eat. I'm joined, as always, by my man Mike at Mike, Be- Mike Me Up on Twitter. How you doing today, Mike? Doing good, man. Getting ready to cipher through all this combine buzz and uh, see, talk about why Zach Moss sucks. Yep, and we heard the noise. We heard that you liked our guest last week. Goes by the name of Nick Urcolano. Some of you guys online call him dad. Some of you call him father. Uh, I just call him Nick because I want to be respectful and I will <laughs> never let another man father me. I- <laughs> Power bottom. <laughs> All right, this whole thing's about to get cut. But before, before we hit the intro, uh, we're just talking about winners and losers from the combine this week. Guys like Zach Moss that Nick loved and now hates. Uh, other guys like Chase Claypool, who looked like DK Metcalf's son. Uh, everybody, you know, either surprised or, well, some guys surprised, some guys didn't surprise at all, and they moved up and down in our rankings because of that. So, without further ado, let's hit that intro. Hit it. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's get into things. Um, You know, a lot of stuff happened. Everyone was hype. You know, the 40 times were off by like 0.2 seconds when they first showed on the broadcast, as usual. Uh, But once everything settled, we kind of got a good look at uh, some of the athletes that are coming into the draft. And, you know, Jonathan Taylor, obviously the big name at 226 pounds, cracked the 4-4 sound barrier. What do you guys think about that? Is that? Do you think that matters at all? Does that change anything for you, or is it just like all fluff? Yeah, I expected him to be fast. I mean, four three nine is ridiculous for a guy that size, but there's another guy who hit that mark that not many people are talking about. But yeah, any time a running back that size like goes past four five into that four four range, that's ridiculous. A lot of people are comping him to Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb was low four fives, so the fact that he beat him out by like point one three seconds, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with in the NFL. Yeah, it's going to be sick when Zach Moss does it at his pro day and everyone <laughs> finally, so finally shows him the fucking respect. Yeah, he doesn't pull his hammy jumping straight up in the air. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I think we just need to, like, preface the episode and, and just let him know, you know, we're going to be talking about, as Mike said, the, the winners and losers from the combine. And uh, a lot of these guys that we'll talk about, I don't necessarily think, like, Jonathan Taylor, I wouldn't say is a winner from the – he is only because he was, like, so outrageous, but for the most part – we should have expected him to be testing in these in this range, you know. So he's not necessarily a winner. He's not someone that whose draft stock was uh, changed as much as like a guy like Denzel Mims or like Justin Jefferson or whatever. So we're going to try to uh, really dive into the guys that we think made the biggest impact, right? There are there are going to be tons of guys that run fast and do shit like yep. that and test well, but a lot of them we had already expected to. So uh, Jonathan Taylor, one of those guys, of course. Um, I think the the bigger question here is like, do you move? We we put out our consensus rankings this week and do we move Jonathan Taylor to the RB1 now that we know he's the elite athlete that we already fucking knew he was? Yeah, no, I mean, I had him as my one before going into the combine, and I, I think uh, we left basically Swift at the first spot. I mean, this it's like one of those marginal moves where, like, we knew he was fast. Um, so I, I agree with you. I don't think he's, like, a huge winner or anything, but I think it's, like, kind of cool that he broke that 4-4, even though it's so stupid, right? Because he, all he did was 4.39, which is basically 4-4, but it seems like, you know, the general media and general people in general don't know how rounding works. So with that 4-3 handle, there's like, oh, wow, he ran like a 4-3. So I think from yeah. that perspective, I also think it, it makes like the NFL teams, there's going to be one or two of them now that want to grab him in the first round. And if that's yeah. the case, then we're going we're gonna to have to move him up to the, the overall RB1 and overall 101 for, um, for dynasty drafts. But I mean, Swift has been our guy for a while prior to you moving, you know, Jonathan Taylor over him. And I feel like we saw like within the entire dynasty community, it was like, everyone likes Swift. And then everyone just started moving to Taylor. And I was just like, fuck that. I'm just, I'm keeping yeah. Swift at the one one Cause I'm just not about to put Taylor there. I hope yeah. Swift goes above him. That would make me very happy. Yeah. yeah. Swift yeah. didn't show anything at the combine that if you had him at RB one prior to it, it didn't show any reason for you to move him back to RB two. I mean, he ran right. a four, four, eight. And I think common consensus amongst at least us three was that he was going to run in the four fives. So he did a little bit better than we expected. I was telling Mike, I think his 40 time was more impressive, not how fast he ran, but like how fast he ran over expected than what Jonathan Taylor did because we were kind of expecting low four fours for Taylor, whereas Swift was in the mid four fives. And the fact that he broke that four five barrier uh, to me was like pretty impressive. We know he has that receiving ability. We know he's probably going to go round one or round two. So there was no reason for me to move him down. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's move on to the next guy. I just put him on here again. It's kind of similar story with Jonathan Taylor. Like I, I figured he would run fast, and it's Cam Akers. 
came in and hit that 4-4 barrier, which is, I think, for him, I think it's a big deal because uh, there wasn't much buzz around him in the main circles. And then kind of after this weekend, everyone saw him test out athletically. And I think he's kind of jumping into that conversation. So if anything, like, you know, we're talking about biggers, bigger risers and uh, biggest fallers. It's because of what we think it'll do to their draft capital. It's not because, like, we think that the players are, like, shittier or they're better now because they run, like, 0.3 seconds faster. It's more just, like, us trying to account for the fact that, like, look, NFL teams care about this stuff. So, you know, even if we don't care about it, you kind of have to, like, learn about it and know about it and try and figure out what the impacts are. Yeah, basically, uh, basically we – had to sit around all fucking weekend and watch the combine for you guys so that we can give you the inside scoop on guys like acres. Cause when he does the lateral agility footwork things there at the combine, Jesus Christ, like you're not going to see that in the player profile or profiles or, you know, on any sort of tangible sheet, but this kid's feet are unbelievable. Like just watching, it was weird. Like I just watched him do it for like five seconds. I was like, I might move him up to RB one. And I was like, no, <laughs> hey, relax, relax. But, dude, this kid looks so fucking good. So, yeah, he's a guy who, like, there's going to be a huge pack of Tier 2, Tier 3 running backs who do get separated by the NFL teams via the combine, right? And you have, like, for all we know, going into it, like, uh, Akers, Clyde Allaire, um, and fucking, like, Zach Moss and those middle guys, one combine performance going one way or another is going to be the difference between being a round two and a round four guy. So, like, Akers showing up and doing what we thought he would do athletically is the reason that he's going to go in round two or, like, earliest – uh, or latest early round three, right? And he's going to separate himself from the guys who are kind of non-athletes in a sense. So that was, yeah, it was, I mean, definitely not someone who's going to catapult into the first round most likely, but like just him hitting really good athletic marks is is uh, really good to see. And he's my RB3 now because we didn't get to see J.K. Dobbins test. All we know is that he came in way underweight, which was uh, yeah. a little bit concerning there. So yeah, Akers, got to love him there. I I'll probably debate seeing where the draft capital is. I'll, I'll debate him into the RB. I mean, he's right there in that in that top tier for sure. What was the point of J.K. Dobbins going into it, right? He came in underweight, and then he benched 23 reps, and he just didn't do anything else. Like, what was he trying to prove? Like, is he in a bodybuilding competition? I, I didn't understand that move. <laughs> like, I didn't hear that he was hurt or anything. Some people were saying high ankle sprain. I don't know. He was my running back four going into it. The fact that Akers affirmed our beliefs in all these Nike pro camps were right, saying that he was going to run a 4-4. Four -four. The fact that he went out there and did it, and as you said, in those drills, just looking like a madman, his feet. Uh, in one of the videos we were recording this past weekend, I told Mike it looked like one of those like pushing lawnmowers where like the blazers <laughs> spinning real fast. Mm -hmm. He was going through those cones like it was nobody's business. And that's what happens when you get cam makers out in space when he doesn't have, you know, 11 guys right in his, right in his grill mix because his offensive lineman laid down on the snap. So, yeah, he really <laughs> showed that he belongs in that top three. If the draft capital is there, which at this point, I don't understand how it couldn't be there. I mean, the fact that like fantasy analysts or whatever you want to call us, we know how bad his offensive line is. I'm sure the guys in front offices know the situation he was in as well. And the fact that he has an all around like three down skill set, he can pass block, he can pass catch and everything. Uh, if he goes round two or round three to a good landing spot, there's potential for him to move into that top two, not only just the top three. I like a, a guy like Akers just because not him personally, but the situation he's in, like we know he's not going to go in the first round. Okay. You take that back. You must we, like him personally. He's a great guy. Know, we know damn well. He's not, he's a terrible fucking person. He's not going to the first <laughs> round. But that means he's really like fair game for any team to draft him, which is cool because he can, you know, I feel like with the, whoever the top running back is, it's going to end up being like last year we saw Jacobs score the Raiders. We knew that was going to happen this year. I feel like it's going to be like the Dolphins or like one of those kind of shit teams that have multiple extra picks in the first round. That's where like Jonathan Taylor will probably end up. But with Akers, like if he's sitting there in the third round with the Chiefs on the on the clock. Like there's a very real chance that that ends up happening, you know. I don't yeah. see how he wouldn't be my running back one if he's on the Chiefs, even if Swift and Taylor both go round one to decent landing spots. Anybody like Damian Williams, if he was a rookie in this class, really he'd that? be like my Let running me, back one. If, if Taylor and Swift both go round one, Akers goes round three to the Chiefs, you're still Akers is still RB1. <sighs> man, yeah, that's so tough, dude. That situation's perfect. That's so tough, man. Yeah, it is. It just depends on where they all go. go. Let's it depends like where they Let's go. Let's pretend I didn't ask that. <laughs> it's too tough. Yeah. Um, so th those are the two big names, obviously, they want to see. You know, I think this next group of guys, um, there's one that we love more than the rest of them, and you'll see that in our ranks. But and uh, Gibson, McFarland, and Evans, the other three kind of like running backs that, that, you know, people knew about, but not, not big names by any means. You know, Gibson, obviously the shocker. You know, we took him out of our running back rankings initially, but put him back because the guy's like 228 pounds and ran a 4.39, basically same speed as Jonathan Taylor. So I think he's a super interesting one. And then obviously uh, Darrington Evans is like Noah's favorite. Uh, Nick's favorite is McFarlane. So I want to hear your thoughts. You know, first let's jump to Nick, man. What You love McFarlane. You love his dreads. 
I mean, you basically want him to marry your future daughter. So tell us a little about why you love him so much. It's a ridiculous intro for Anthony McFarlane, by the way. <laughs> Booger's, Booger's rightful son and the heir to the Booger throne. Uh, McFarlane, I, I like Antonio Gibson more than I like McFarlane. Um, I don't know if that's – was that reflected in my rankings? It was, yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's all in our rankings. Okay, yeah. So McFarlane's like this – what we thought was going to be a smaller back coming into the combine out of, uh, out of Maryland – uh, he, I thought he was going to weigh in in the 195 to 198 range. The guy comes in at 208, I believe, and then runs, yeah. a, a, you know, low fours, mid four fours. What was it? Four, yeah. four, five. Yep. yep. Yeah. So he put on, he put on, uh, on display exactly what I thought would come. He's like a big play type guy that can kind of bust loose for uh, a monster gain at any point. And the fact that he came in at 208 means like he could handle much more of a workload than just being a secondary back. I don't think he would operate as a feature back anywhere in uh, in the NFL but like I love what we saw from him from the combine just in terms of the weight in terms of the long speed while coming in at that weight um and you know just uh let me pull up his, his profile real quick I don't know if any yeah, you guys I got it. it yeah it's kind of wild you know 5'8 208 it's kind of wild that like some people like we view some guys as workhorses and other guys as like role players but they're all the same size you know like McFarlane yeah, Clyde and Edwards percentile which is not Obvious. what I expected you see him yeah. he's like he's not I mean He's not necessarily that thick. So when he came in with an 80th percentile BMI, I was happy to see. He did come with a terrible burst score, though. The uh, the vertical jump was not um, was not something to be jealous of. Eighth percentile for that. So that's uh, a little bit concerning. But like from everything I've seen on tape, this kid is absolutely a playmaker, and I'm super excited to see where he lands. He could. End, he, he's one of those guys that can go anywhere from like the third to the fifth round, though, which makes me a little bit nervous about him. So I'm not really in terms of talent. I'll put the stamp on him right now. But as soon as draft capital hits, you know that could be a totally different story. Yeah, low vertical just means good pad level, so I'm fine with that. On top of that, like, they were talking at the combine, him working out with the receiver group or wanting to be tested as a receiver, and his receiving ability in college wasn't really put on display. But the fact that coaches and scouts wanted to see him, you know, try to make that transition at least speaks that maybe he's going to be a third down threat in the NFL and then maybe transition into a first and second down back. And, you know, we brought up last week, if the starter gets hurt on a team, he has that skill set to be able to take over for one to two weeks and give you fantasy relevance. Yep, exactly. And then, you know, the last guy we all talked about, Antonio Gibson, you'll see where we rank him in a bit. But, you know, player profiler has him uh, comp to Joe Mixon. I don't know if I'd go that far, but this dude Bro, was an explosive I don't know. playmaker. I feel like they were spot on with the Antonio Gibson, like David Johnson comp. They said that That's before. Right. And, like, just to give everyone context, if you're not really sure who Antonio Gibson is, it's a kid who played on, Memf uh, on Memphis, and he was utilized as, like, a, a wide receiver slash running back. But he is so electric, and I tweeted this out a couple of days ago got a lot of heat from people that were like Memphis fans, of course. <laughs> they gave this kid 71 total touches this year. 71 total touches. So that's five touches per game. He finished with 1,100 yards from scrimmage and 12 touchdowns. And the kickoff yep. return for a touchdown. It was almost 20 yards per reception, 11.2 yards per carry. So this yep. kid was not getting the ball. But like I, like, like Mike said before, six foot, 228, 439 speed. Like he, he is basically David Johnson. When you watch him, he is extremely elusive. He is huge. Um, if, if he goes to like – he goes to Tampa Bay where Bruce Arians was the one who like put David Johnson on like you can't ask for a better landing spot than that you know he, that's why he's our, our what consensus RB6 yep, yep that's right what if he goes to Arizona what if they don't bring back Kenyon Drake and they use him in the backfield and when they go five wide he just plays a slot him and David Johnson that could be yeah. like a fastball slow like curveball that could be like yeah, David fastball, Johnson fastball. really slow ball <laughs> yeah exactly it, it would throw him that's the only way David Johnson works in 2020 it's the only way I'll draft him <laughs> is they put Antonio Gibson beside him in the backfield both of them are like doing the same thing but at completely different speeds <laughs> yep all in big W uh, those are the guys we want to cover for running backs in terms of receivers we got some big one more names. Mike I don't, I don't mean to cut you off but what about big boy AJ Dillon oh yeah dude I totally forgot dude, dude AJ Dillon was basically not on our radar I mean to me, like he, he he came off as basically much of a plotter when I watched him, um, but I mean, no, actually, dug, dug into some of his advan advanced metrics there. Like, what would you find? Yeah, I think he had 87 broken tackles on the season and something like a 27% broken tackle rate, which among all these guys is very high. It's higher than J.K. Dobbins. It's higher. I believe it was higher than Jonathan Taylor and DeAndre Swift. So this guy just isn't a plotter. He's not just running into the back of his offensive lineman like Trent Richardson. He has that speed that he showed at the combine. When you watch him on tape, like he doesn't look fast. He doesn't have speed. And the other thing is, like, I saw the broken tackle rate. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what the, so there's something got to give with the math because the guy averages like five yards per carry. And I get like the broken tackle, the raw numbers are there. But that's what happens when you get 350 carries in a season. Like, oh, you better be fucking ranking top 10 in, in tackles because everybody else is getting 130 carries a season. So with Dylan, I'm like, I'm, 
I, I still have a red flag in terms of his efficiency for running. Like all the raw metrics tell you that he can be good at the next level, the, you know, the, the long speed and the burst and the uh, just explosiveness, but you never saw that on tape. Like he was never breaking away from guys. My concern with the broken tackle rate is that he's not elusive whatsoever, that they were all just like arm tackles and, and smaller guys in college trying to get him down that couldn't do that. Yeah, could definitely be the case. I mean, he the reason why you have to put him on your radar, though, is because, like, he just tested, like, out at the gym. Yeah. And if we're trying to guess, like, draft capital, I think that put really puts him on the map. I mean, this guy's 250 pounds, basically you really a lineman. Think, though, you think an NFL team is going to be like, I want – I'm going to draft a 200 percent running back. 100%. Operate? Really? I think, I think like, because all it takes is one stupid team, right? Like, there's 32 teams. You don't need all 32 teams to think he's good. You just need one dumb one to be like, oh, man, like, we need this, like, thumper to establish the run, especially with, like, what Henry did and all the Henry comps and all the Henry buzz he's getting. I think he did, like, a, a, a lot to actually boost his draft stock. And, like, it's not like he didn't produce, right? He was actually a really good producer in college. Like, at, in his freshman year, he was already a prolific producer. He just, I yeah, mean, he's just not exciting. Right he doesn't just catch any fucking like, passes either, though. Like, yeah, for he, he fantasy purposes, yeah. you want out of him. You need him to be like a goal line back. So I currently have him as my running back nine. I'm a little bit hesitant as to like how well he's going to translate to a fantasy asset. But the way that he performed at the combine, it's kind of hard to leave him outside of your top ten because I think the draft capital goes along with the performance that he had. Yeah, exactly. Like the production's there, the draft capital's there, and like NFL teams are dumb, man. Like they're just going to do stuff like that. I, I just wouldn't put it past them. So yeah, I can't uh, wait for the NFL draft to come same. out. Some weird so we shit's just going to happen. Totally there. trash all our rankings and then start again. Um, beautiful. Yeah. Next up, uh, Denzel Mims, man. Dude, this guy absolutely loaded up. That's we, our boy. We talked about him on the last rankings episode. I think we had him about, you know, how far do we have him? Up? We had him like five five above ADP or something like that. And, you know, now we've moved him up a little bit, but it's not because we, it's not really because we moved him up. It's because we kind of had to move other guys down because he kind of flopped at the combine. So he's like, he kind of moved up as a byproduct of that. We kind of already had him in the high spot, but man, this dude literally jumped out the goddamn gym, right? He came in at 207 pounds, 6'3", 96 percentile 40 yard dash with a 4.38. 96th percentile speed score, 90th percentile burst score because he jumped like 40 inch plus vert, uh, a 67th percentile agility score, and what is a the 96th knock percentile. What's uh, the uh, what's the objective knock? Is it is that that he played four years? That's it. I mean that it's a small knock, but yeah, that's like you ideally you wanted to see him come out last year, but he had a down year, and then like mm -hmm. I said, I covered this again. He went back, but then he like improved. So like if you go yeah. back, that's exactly what you want to see, right? You don't want to see him go back and then stay steady or like drop more. That would be really really bad. But he didn't do that. He went back and still produced. So so you know, it's like it's a little bit of a flag, but not that much. So basically, my my take last week of of T Higgins wishing he could be Denzel Mims came to fruition. <laughs> And I am forever right about Denzel Mims for everything he does in his Shut further the NFL, fuck up. NFL and One of the career. biggest facts you've ever portrayed on this channel <laughs> is that he's better than Titty Higgins. I, I completely agree with you. And as Mike was saying, right, he had that down year as a junior. Jalen Hurd went to Baylor that year, and he was basically soaking up all the targets in the slot. It's basically the same thing we saw with Brian Edwards when Debo Samuel had his breakout year. Uh, his numbers went down, but the fact that both of those guys uh, improved during their senior seasons, proved it on tape, proved it analytically, now that Mims has showed it at the comment that he's not only one of the biggest, most at, like physical receivers, he's also one of the more athletic guys. He actually had the fastest or whatever, the best three cone drill among all these receivers. It was like half a second faster than Jalen Rager, which is pretty incredible considering you think <laughs> Jalen Rager is one of the most agile guys in this class. So he checks basically every box and I'm pretty sure he moved into our top five. Yeah, I mean, he's going to get the draft capital for sure. He kind of put himself on the map. Definitely made a couple of I was going to say, where's he going that. now? Is he going to go end of first round? I mean, it's possible, but I think it's probably more likely that it's a second. Yeah, I saw uh, a wait. lot of people talking about the Bengals taking him at the 33rd pick, first pick of the second round to replace AJ Green. Aren't they going mean, to? They're going to franchise him, no? Yeah, I but I, they think. Uh, I mean, you think you're going to franchise him so you can probably trade him as well, right? Because you don't, don't want him to just like walk off, try and get something for him. You um, know, he can walk I, off at this point. Never know what the fuck the Bengals are doing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyways, Mims, big winner. Another big winner, big name is Justin Jefferson. And he's an interesting one because I actually expected him to not test that well because when we were watching him on tape, it's not like he didn't come <laughs> off as like a burner for me, you know? No, our text, I, I just, like if you go to our text, it was like, I can't wait for Je Jefferson and about to run like a 469 or 472. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we were totally wrong on that. He actually ran a 4-4-3 at 202 and 6-1 in 80th percentile burst score as well. So jumping out the gym on that end. I think he's someone that really boosted his stock. He was already prominent on the national stage, um, was a prolific producer this year. 
I mean, honestly, is in the conversation for Bublinikov if he wasn't playing with the best receiver on his on the on the team just opposite him. So I don't know, man. I think Jefferson's really good. Uh, we the thing I like about Mims and Jefferson is like these are two guys that we already liked, and it's just that the Conway kind of you know confirmed and didn't like knock him down the ranks. Yeah, I, I wonder what's more likely to happen. Like Joe Burrow is a fraud, and all his weapons are really good, or vice versa. Ooh, I think the vice versa is more likely. Really, you think Joe Burrow is a beast and his weapons are fraudulent? No, 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 no. I think yeah, I think like his weapons are good, and Joe Burrow might be the yeah. fraud. Yeah, maybe they're all just really good. Not gonna happen, yeah. but maybe they're just all like really fraudulent, and Joe Brady's gonna <laughs> turn the Carolina Panthers. Everybody around. sucks, and and Coach Ed Audrin is really the fucking <laughs> the god. Go, go Tigers! Go Tigers! All right, yeah, Justin Jefferson's a fucking beast. Uh, he would. Um, hopefully slide into a slot role. Uh, 6'1", 200 pounds, 202. So he's got pretty good size uh, relative to what the NFL looks for today. Again, 4'4", 3 speed is just, you know, fucking incredible com- considering what we thought we were going to see. But he's someone that comes out um, and he's relatively looked at as a very, very good route runner. So I think he could play the outside, but I would love to see him just play in the slot. I would love to see like everybody, every, every big bodied wide receiver in the NFL, just throw him in the slot. I don't know what NFL coaches are doing. Yeah, big slot is, like, so valuable for fantasy, whether it's Cooper Cup or Tyler Boyd, who are both much less athletic objectively than Justin Jefferson. If he finds himself in a role in playing the big slot, like, we saw him do it at college. He had, like, over 100 catches, 18 touchdowns. It was in an elite offense. But I think he's somebody that year one, if you draft him in the first round, he's going to return value for you because, you know, that big slot role soaks up targets, more targets, more opportunity, more uh, availability to produce. So he's somebody that – you know, if you're a little bit worried that C.D. Lamb is going to take a little bit to adjust to the NFL or Jalen Rager, one of these guys, and you'd rather take a shot in the second round on a wide receiver to return value early, I think Justin Jefferson's a good pivot play there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a couple other big risers, um, both massive, massive dudes. Michael Pittman Jr. had a very quietly good combine, you know, ran like a low four or five. He's like massive, like almost like 230 pounds and good catch radius, decent three cone. I know, Nick, you're pretty high on him. Like, what were your thoughts about Pittman? Yeah, I mean, he's just uh, objectively, again, he checks a lot of the boxes. Like you said, he's got that real big, like alpha size, 6'4", 223. And his testing actually caught me by surprise because it's like, not that he's like clumsy looking, but when you're that big, you don't expect someone to kind of run out of the gym. Yeah. And his 93rd percentile speed score is really, really good to see. Uh, he was, you know, average or above average in every other athletic test. Uh, so burst, agility. He was good in agility, which was a little bit of a surprise to me, to be honest. I think the only thing that we have as like a red flag on his profile is, is the breakout age, right? He stayed all four yeah. years at USC, didn't break out until he was 21 years old. So um, might have to go back and check out, you know, dive into a little bit more context in terms of like teammate score and um, and things like that. But I mean, yeah, I'm 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 pretty high on Pittman. Uh, we'll have to see where he lands because we're going to need a team that needs an alpha receiver because he's not someone that's going to contribute on special teams whatsoever. He's not really a versatile player. And that tends to be the case when you have like these big dudes that can't really do much besides fucking dominate on the outside. So um, I know you've comped players to like Alshon Jeffrey, but I could see him playing that type of role on an offense where um, he's not great like you know move moving around and, and being super versatile taking screens and shit like that but he could definitely dominate for a team on the outside yeah, yeah for me super- he, rem- he reminds me a lot of mike williams of the chargers somebody that can win deep and you know, he's very good at tracking the ball i did the write-up on him and time after time just watching him on film he's very good with his body control he just mosses players and he's strong after the catch as well uh, but on top of that i'm pretty sure he had either over 90 or over 100 catches so he was being used in the short game also he was decent enough after the catch uh, on top of that, as you were saying, right, his agility score was very good. He had the fourth highest, the fourth fourth fastest three cone drill uh, in the combine. So he really checked a lot of boxes. As for his breakout age, he did get injured in his junior year, I believe. I think he only played 10 games and he was competing with Amon Ross St. Brown, who I think Mike has like in his top five Debbie receivers. I don't know yeah, anything about the kid. Yeah, I just know he's good. He played with Sam Darnold early in his career. So uh, maybe you wanted him to produce a little bit earlier. But the fact that he went out there and absolutely dominated during his senior year, uh, that he did really well at the combine. If draft capital is there, he's somebody that might write off that late breakout age and want to take a stab at him. Yeah, he's yeah. someone that like should should do well at, in the NFL. But if he doesn't, we'll easily be able to go back and just like I mean, he didn't he didn't do shit until he was 21, and we should have seen <laughs> it coming, you know. But he's someone I'm I'm willing if he stays in like the third round of rookie drafts, he's definitely someone I'm willing to uh, to grab there. No, for sure. That's a great price. I mean, uh, nice guy up, Chase Claypool, designated as a wide receiver. I know Noah was studying some film on him last night. I mean, I'm personally not a fan. I don't think he's that good. And the only way I'll be interested is if he moves over to tight end. But uh, what, do, what do you think in there, Noah? 
Yeah, to me, he's like a discount uh, Michael Pittman, right? He's like the same size. He's obviously a lot more athletic than Pittman was, but just watching him on film, and of course, it's completely subjective, but a lot of his plays, a lot of the time when he got the ball in his hands, it was like three-yard shallow crossing routes, right? He wasn't really beating too many people deep. The one time I did see him beat people deep in the Navy game, I think he had four touchdowns, but the only one where he burned a defensive player, he was matched up with a linebacker. So if we see that in the next level, they want to use him split out as a tight end, kind of like a Darren Waller. I was going to say, sure. did they not designate him as a tight end already? How the fuck are you going to put I someone who's 240 pounds at wide receiver? <laughs> like, we already saw this with Kelvin Benjamin. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> Kelvin Benjamin dominated for like one year, and then he ate himself out of the league. But yeah, I- I'm not too high on Chase Claypool unless he moves to tight end. If he gets that eligibility on Yahoo or whatever, then you know I-, I would be fine drafting him in his rookie year to hopefully like see him produce. The fact that he did well at the combine makes me believe he's going to be like a second or third round pick, which is probably Fate. dumb because we we saw the same thing with Miles Boykin last year and he contributed nothing this year to the Ravens. So, yeah, I'm not too high on him, but it's you can't say he didn't dominate the combine this year. Wait, did they really? Has he not really been like uh, put in with like tight ends yet? I feel like no, not yet. Is. That's weird. Not yet. So, I mean, if he doesn't do that, I, I mean, my suggestion is you guys just fade him because, like, to me, he's just not that good of a receiver. And even if he goes tight end, to be honest, chances of him succeeding are, are pretty low unless he gets used properly. But that's not someone that I'll be targeting. But speaking of tight ends, man, Big Al went Absolutely. out there. I can't even pronounce it. I don't know. I'm not going to try. I don't want to get shot. Um, no, let's try. It's like uh, Big, Big Al Oku, 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 Just do the fucking oh, no. Super Bowl Shakira. <laughs> Albert Okuwambunum. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I don't want to butcher his name, but hey, 258 pounds, six six. He ran a 4.49 official for a 99th percentile speed score. I think it's like one of the top four speed scores of all time. If you go and look at this dude on Player Profiler, <laughs> and you told me that he ran a 4.4, I would tell you to kick rocks because he I would not like have the, He looks like a dude in like fucking fourth grade that grew to be 6'5 when everyone else was still like fucking. <laughs> no, five, you know what he looks like? That movie tall. where like they showed The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson when he was younger and he had like his <laughs> oh, yeah. hair torn out. I don't know what that's from. I saw it, but that's exactly what he looks like. Yeah, he's it's, it's that, uh, that he's spy commercial. Here. The spy movie. He's really happy his mom took him to McDonald's or something. That's what he looks like in that picture. <laughs> but yeah, he didn't test in anything else. I mean, he didn't He didn't jump, and I think it was for good reason. His agent basically said, yo, you just ran a 4-4, sit down, like, don't do anything else. Because I think that really helped his draft stock. He's someone that was actually really high on everyone's uh, draft boards, I'd say, like a couple years ago. Uh, he took a huge flop this year in production, you know, whether that's because of losing Drew Locke or whatever it is. And he kind of fell off the radar. But, you know, draft capital and athleticism for tight ends definitely are two very important things. So I think he put himself on the map with this one. And, uh, you know, we'll be on the lookout for Big Al coming into the league. I think yeah, I know breakout age doesn't matter for tight ends as much, but he was competing with Emmanuel Hall, who we loved last year. And he also had, you know, Drew Locke there. And then this past season, he lost Drew Locke to Kelly Bryant, and that offense just wasn't the same. So he didn't produce all too much this year, but he's been a touchdown threat his entire uh, career. So, yeah, he's somebody I'm looking for, especially, you know, his draft capital is going to bump up after running a 4.49 at that size. So yeah, he's somebody I'm going to take a shot on. He's in my top three tight ends right now. Yeah, I, I want to throw out that stat that I sent to you guys last night. With When he was a freshman, the reason he was on the Debbie uh, radar so early is because when he was a freshman, he was a fucking baller. Back in 2017, his first year, I think it, there is also something else to be said that he's only played nine games each of the three seasons. So I'm not actually sure if it was like in, all injury related or some off the field issues, but that is something else to note. If you can't play double digit games in college, then you've got a longer season ahead of you in the NFL. And that's something to uh, look into and take context behind but I don't think any of these tight ends are going to end up going that early in rookie draft so you're probably going to be able to take stabs at them like late second round third round for a lot of them um, but for for Al the reason he was on the radar so early he scored 11 touchdowns in 2017 his freshman year that was uh, tied with AJ Brown for the for the SEC lead for receiving touchdowns his freshman year that was while he was sharing a field with two NFL prospects who also ranked within the top five of receiving touchdowns in the uh, SEC in Emmanuel Hall and Jamon Moore who both had 10 he had 11 so um you've been upgraded again no that's huge huge for the huge for the business Did um it? I didn't even click yeah. anything this time it's epic they just keep giving it to us um so they know they know what I'm preaching right now is fucking real so they're like the god we give it up for our boy <laughs> right now yeah so so Al was like prolific at a very early age and I think that was just great to see because you don't necessarily need tight ends to be putting up like 800 yards each season we've seen so many successful NFL tight ends that don't 
uh, produce at, in college. Maybe they have one good year of like 45 for 600 and eight touchdowns or something. That's really all you need to see. And he did that immediately when he got onto the scene. So um, yes, he's looked a little bit sluggish and I, I don't really know why that was because he just came out and fucking dominated the 40. Uh, but Alberts, I mean, he's going to be someone that shoots up the draft board just because you don't see tight ends 6'6", 258 run a sub four five forty. It's just out of this world. So he uh, absolutely rose his draft stock. Yep. Um, so that's Kittle's like the poster child for not producing and then dominating after we found out he was athletic. I could see, you know, obviously not to that extent, but he's somebody that could break out, you know, two, three years down the road and, you know, show that athleticism really does matter for tight ends. Yeah, for sure. Um, next, going to move on to the fallers. And one name, you know, we already mentioned him, but J.K. Dobbins. And, you know, he's kind of falling, not because he did anything bad. It's just because, like, he kind of, he was kind of in that upper echelon with everyone else and everyone else exploded and he kind of, you know, didn't do much because he was injured or whatever reason. So I wouldn't say he's like a huge faller, but I would just say that it's something to notice that, you know, guys like Akers, JT, and Swift all kind of did really well and outperformed expectations while he well, kind of remained yeah. quiet. It's just because everything else, was, it's it, going into the combine, it's all hypothetical. Like you put up your rankings and you could say how fast a guy is, how explosive a guy is, then we get to actually see it on the field. And J.K. Dobbins didn't perform. So we're not saying he's not athletic, but we're just saying we know where everyone else stands. So how can we just be as high on him knowing where everyone else stands, but we don't know what he does. And the other thing is that he came in underweight. So it's just like there's there's a confusing signs being thrown at us from J.K. Dobbins' side. So I would err with caution until we really see what's up. Um, obviously, they have the pro day. And, like, I, I think there is some, some realness to the fact, like, T. Higgins didn't perform. I'm sure we're going to talk about him in a second maybe for, as, as a faller. Um, and he was like, yeah, you know, I played into the championship game. So I had way less time to prepare for this thing. Totally makes sense. But like, so did Justin Jefferson. So did <laughs> Justin Jefferson. H. Like, so did all these guys who perform well at the combine. So it's like, yeah, that is, uh, I guess, a valid excuse. But I mean, get on the field and fucking show that you want to be here and compete against the best athletes in the country. Or you're moving down our draft board. Yeah, he's been down my draft board. And the fact that Akers, Taylor and Swift came in at very good weights. They produced in college. Uh, all of them, except for Taylor, I'd say, are very good pass catchers. But Taylor has, like saw 36 targets last year, and he was very efficient with the targets that he did see. So I don't see any reason you could have Dobbins ahead of these three, at least at this point, especially with how reliant he was on a mobile quarterback and offensive line play. Uh, Akers, we all know his offensive line was garbage, and he still produced. Uh, and the other two guys, Swift and Taylor, they really have an all-around skill set. Taylor, not as much, but he's just such a dominant runner and how, athle how athletic he is. Um, unless J.K. Dobbins can prove that his Nike protesting or whatever is true and run like a 4-3, uh, then sure, he could possibly move up our boards if he falls in round one or round two in the real NFL draft. But yeah, as Nick said, at this point, the other guy showed stuff. J.K. Dobbins showed nothing other than he's got big pecs. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A big loser from the combine is uh, Zach Moss. Uh, and I know, you know, he was a big dog favorite. But, uh, look, I mean, whatever it is, I think his agent said that he, like, tweaked his, like, hamstring or something when he was doing the vertical, which, I mean, I don't know how far he, how he jumped, but it wasn't, wasn't great on that end either. And advised him to run anyway. Poor advice. I probably would have told him to sit down. But he basically went out there, ran a 4.65, and, you know, not good from a speed perspective and then didn't really do much else. So I think that's going to really hurt his draft stock. I mean, what do you guys think about Zach Moss? Nick, you were, you were a big favorite of him. Yeah, so uh, that wasn't that wasn't really fun to watch Zach Moss come out here and, and run a four six five. Uh, I don't know of the validity of of the hamstring tweak and how much it affected him, uh, but but I'll try to be unbiased because had this been a player that I didn't like, I would be like, yeah, it's bullshit. He didn't tweak his hamstring like he's just fat, slow. So Zach Moss, uh, I'll I'll be honest. I'm I'll, I'm kind of intrigued to see what he actually runs at the pro day. Had he tweaked his hamstring, but like as as uh, most people do in the industry, you know, you tack on half a tenth of a second onto it. So he's going to have to really, really do well at his pro. He's going to have to run like a four or five, five at his pro day just to hit that four, six mark. The problem with that is like, you know, we don't necessarily like slow backs and there are guys that succeed in spite of it. Like Josh Jacobs last year ran like, what, like high four sixes, but he also had the first round draft capital. And Zach Moss, if he's in the four, six, seven, whatever, he's not getting first round draft capital, which is a problem. So you can't be slow with bad draft capital and no burst or agility so we'll have to see what he tests at the um at the pro day but yeah absolutely fucking devastating performance for for mr moss yeah for me he moved down my ranks just because not that i didn't think he would be a lot faster than he was right i kind of expected low four fives mid four fives i think the fact that he ran a four six five is going to move him down actual nfl draft boards which you know like a david montgomery last year right the draft capital 
he, I think he was the third back taken, but he landed in a pretty terrible spot with a terrible offensive line. We know he doesn't have that burst or that juice. If he falls in a similar situation, like he's a guy who needs a hole to open up. He's very patient behind the line and then he hits it. If he lands in a similar spot to David Montgomery, I don't see him really producing much, not only in his rookie year, but going forward. We know he's a good pass catcher, but yeah, altogether it wasn't a great showing for him from him, especially with all the other athletic backs that were previously ranked before him uh, now moving ahead of him. Can we, yeah, can we also like petition for one thing? Like why does the combine give out the the times right away? Like the unofficial time? <laughs> yeah. It's like so there's no reason for them to fucking throw a 4-7-3 at us. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like film <laughs> grinders can check their accuracy. They like, want to see how good they are. It's ridiculous. They're like 4-7-3, like official time, like literally a tenth of a second faster. It's like, I remember it was Mike, a, it was with Hunter Bryant. Charlie. Like, oh, it's officially a 4-6 and then it was actually like a worse than <laughs> on TV. <laughs> Yeah, like, I don't know why they do that. Just either fucking get better technology or just wait until it's official to, to tell us. Like, what's the point? Dude, of it's that Charlie, teams? that Charlie Cassie hand, the hand watch accuracy time. Dude, it's I so good. Um, dude, player profile already went full savage and put the put the Michael Jordan crying meme on Zach Moss's player yeah. profiler page show. That shit was unnecessary. I felt, <laughs> it was definitely, it felt definitely a bit overflowed. felt personal, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, another big name, uh, Clyde edwards alaire Went out there and, you know, he actually did pretty good in the burst drills, right? Like, and that kind of shows up on tape. Like, he jumped the, I think he jumped like 39 inches or something vertical and ran out there and ran a 4.6, which is not ideal, I guess, at his size. Um, we didn't really move him down our boards much because, I mean, he's someone where it kind of did show up on tape and 4.6 isn't like awful, right? It's like you're kind of right on the border there. Um, what do you guys think about Clyde Edwards there? Like, no, like, I know you didn't move him. Like, what do you think about him moving forward? Yeah, for me, I, I don't think an NFL team's drafting him to be a burner, somebody who's going to have a lot of breakaway runs. I think what he showed this year is that even with a bad offensive line, I know LSU had a great one, but he was able to make men miss behind the line of scrimmage. I think that's what he's going to contribute in the NFL. And on top of that, right, sure, he wasn't fast, but he's easily, if not DeAndre Swift, it's him as the best pass-catching running back in this class. He's going to bring you a ton of fantasy value right away because he's somebody who can just step in, catch 50-plus balls as a rookie. We've seen Tariq Cohen over the past couple of years do nothing on the ground, just catching 70 balls and being a decent enough RB3. For fantasy purposes, I'm fine leaving him as my running back five going into this class. If the draft capital is there, which, you know, we've said that with every single guy, but I think he's somebody coming from a high pedigree system, uh, producing in that offense. He's somebody who's going to go round two, round three. Uh, if that's the case, yeah, I'm fine taking him as my running back five. Yeah, he was someone that, like, I want after watching the combine, I was like, ah, 207 pounds, 4640. Like, I'm going to move him down. And then I went to my rankings and I was like, who can I move him further down? You know? So for me, he didn't move down my rankings. I do think he probably dropped out of that borderline first tier, though. You know, like he was, he was definitely in there in the mix with those top three, four guys or whatever. And I think this 40 moved him down a little bit, but I'm still like very comfortable taking him in the first round somewhere. I think, like, had you watched the tape and seen him, like, break away a bunch of, like, 60-yard runs, and then you saw the 4-6, I'd be like, okay, this is this might be a problem because he's actually Alvin not. Alvin season. Yeah. Like, <laughs> dude, that was fucking crazy. I don't understand what <laughs> happened with him, uh, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, I mean, Clyde is, is someone that, like, uh, dominates through his agility and his burst and things like that. Like, his his side-to-side -side lateral is, is unreal. It's, like, fucking – it's, like, what I look like when I come home drunk, but, like, I do it accidentally. I'm just shifting <laughs> from side of the room to the room, but he's he's unbelievable when you when you watch him. The other thing is he's only 20 years old still, and he'll be um, – I think he might turn 21 right before the draft, but he's way – like, Zach, he's, he's a year and a half younger than a guy like Zach Moss. So if you're going like five, six and had Moss had like a decent combine and you're debating between the two, like age obviously needs to be contextualized. So he's a very young running back as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, next guy up, LaVisca Chanel, man. The guy just can't catch a break. I mean, he, I mean, when he's healthy, like I think we all recognize this. He's like one of the most talented wide receivers in this class. I mean, his physique, his athleticism, his ability to make plays with the ball in his hands. But I think what this combine showed is like more so than him just running a four or five, eight, you know, everyone's expecting him to run four fours, which is kind of ridiculous to begin with. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the fact that he went out and ran really slow and then now people are tagging him with the injury. I think it's more so the fact that he's getting tagged with the injury that's going to hurt him more than like even his 40 time, because now that's all everyone's talking about. Right? Can this guy stay healthy? He can't be healthy in the combine, blah, 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 blah. Like, what are you, are you guys worried about him? Like, are you guys still fine with just taking him? um as kind of one of those top wide receivers like what do you think on that nick i'm worried i'm definitely worried i he, he just seems like someone that i'm gonna have to stay away from if he's a first round rookie pick i'm just not gonna i don't know there, there's a lot of exciting things with him but there's a lot of red flags i'm just like 
I don't know if I want to take these high upside guys early on in drafts because that's, you know, how you build the foundation of your team. When your older players get old and you need to replace them with new young studs, like if LaVisca Scanal comes in and just fucking gets injured every year, you, you can't do anything with him. So I think there are enough red flags where I'm probably staying away from him if I have to take him in the, uh, in the first round. Yeah, for me, the first thing LaVisca Chenault's got to do is fire his agent. Not only did he run with, like, his core all messed up and he had, like, a pelvic injury or something, he also looked like MC G-Bick. Hammer. He was, like, G-Bick. the only one with a baggy shirt running a 40. Like, that definitely <laughs> cannot help when everybody else is wearing spandex. But, yeah, he's, he's basically going to be what we see out of Sammy Watkins where, you know, week one he's going to blow up for 40 points and you want him. And then every other game he just gets injured. He's shown it throughout his collegiate uh, – his time at Colorado – and I wasn't worried about it at first because the injuries weren't so related. It was like a shoulder and then, you know, his core and then something else. But the fact that it just seems to be like, no matter what part of his body it is, it just seems to flare up and get injured, even if it's just running 40 yards down the field. He was my wide receiver four. He moved very far down my rankings because that's that's a big reason for concern. And on top of that, I didn't expect him to be a 4-4 guy, but, you know, 4-5-8 or whatever it was, close to 4-6, that's definitely not uh that's not something you want out of a guy who's seen as a weapon and some guy that can you know run out of the backfield make big plays four six that's not going to get it done at the next level yeah like four or five eight's okay if you're uh, four or five eight is fine for a receiver there's plenty of successful receivers but if chanel's the kind of guy that i feel like he's not that good as as an actual receiver like technical and, and route running and stuff so you need another element to your game like if you're going to be taking handoffs you're going to be doing a lot of shit like that like you need that speed you need game breaking speed for the most part so um, that, it, that was definitely a little bit concerning. We'll see, you know, what he does at the pro day. Maybe he did all that stuff just to make himself look terrible. And then he's going to come away a hero at his pro day when he runs like a four, four, one, that'd be decent to see. But I mean, his, his, his comp on player profile is AJ Brown. Yep. Which, uh, which I guess makes sense just given that like the, the first two pillars are basically what AJ Brown had going and the size speed combination, um, are there, but yeah, I don't know. There, there are just a few too many red flags for me to really want to invest, uh, an early pick on him. Yeah, I'm sure that player profiler comp would actually get some guys excited. Um, I think AJ Brown is actually probably a more refined receiver coming out of college. So um, <clears throat> didn't see that exactly. And I mean, to me, Chano is basically a running back. So he's going to someone that like, he's more of that Debo build, right? Like you're going to line him up in the backfield, make him like run crossing routes, like jet sweeps and all this stuff. So health is just like, health is the only concern that I really have for him. I mean, I, I don't think he's a four or five, eight guy. You know, I think he is probably close to the low four or fives, but we'll see what happens on his pro day. Uh, next up. Uh, one of the big dogs' favorite, Teddy Higgins. <laughs> you got to get Jim with J.K. Dobbins to work out this. Um, again, it's very similar to J.K. Dobbins, where you know it's not like he didn't do anything. It's not like he did anything bad, right? Like this guy still came in with like eighty-one uh, inch wingspan. This guy's basically a fucking pterodactyl, um, and it kind of shows up on tape the way he grabs grabs stuff. But he chose not to run the forty because. You know, he said he had a long season, and, you know, obviously just Jefferson just laughs at that and ran a 4-4-3, so it wasn't a good look. <laughs> Same, bro. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of hurt by that, but, uh, you know, I didn't really, you know, he's still in that same tier for me. Like, I think I've seen enough from him, and hopefully he does something on his pro day. And, again, like, 40 times just aren't that important for wide receivers. Like, hopefully yeah. he doesn't go out and run, like, a 4-9, but, you know, it's just not uh, a key decision maker in, in my process, given what I've seen from from Higgins. What do you guys think? I have shut, actually, I don't want to talk, talk to you guys about Higgins. Guys <laughs> Love that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Next up, uh, both the Bryants, man. This was killer. I mean, I, I was big on Harrison. Uh, sorry, Hunter Bryant, the, a.k.a. the crackhead, according to Nick and Nick and Noah. <laughs> I mean, that's an, that's an objective opinion. <laughs> <laughs> he, he went out there and just didn't really test that well athletically. And, you know, athleticism is something we should care about at the tight end position because it's all about forcing those mismatches and either being, you know, faster and stronger than DBs or just faster than linebackers. And neither of the Bryants, like Harrison Bryant or Hunter Bryant, they both tested like pretty, pretty subpar below average. You know, I'm not sure what that does to their draft stock because, I mean, they're still the best uh pass catchers in the class in my opinion so from a fantasy perspective they're still really good but if they don't get drafted because teams don't think they're big enough to play i think that's going to be a big problem like out of these two like which one would you guys which one do you guys think like is going to actually get some draft capital hunter bryant or harrison bryant probably hunter bryant he's from a power five school and he i don't know he's he didn't test as athletically but i think on tape you know breaking tackles after the catch he just seems like more of a uh, a dynamic player at least in my eyes and probably in some coaches eyes 
Number one, Mike, don't ever disrespect Adam Troutman again by saying these two are the best pass catching tight ends in this class. <laughs> Troutman's a fucking beast. Uh, and number two, Hunter Bryant in those sled drills. I know we were talking about it on over text or whatever. He was just going up to the sled and doing military presses. Like he wasn't trying to block <laughs> at all. It was just that shit was absurd that they even had them doing that. <laughs> literally just like none of them knew like it, it looked as if like they just threw that uh event on them at the at the moment like they were not able to prepare for it and there's like this is what yeah. we're gonna do guys because all of them were like looking around like how do i do this they're like trying to push sled and it just went fucking straight up everywhere. it was like in the blind side when michael orr pushes that guy like 80 yards down the field <laughs> oh, yeah. him up. like that's what they tried to do and it just wasn't working and the guy in the field's like just push it pretend you're blocking it and harrison Bryant just like went full crackhead mode and just tried to lift it up it was it wasn't a good look for him uh definitely being small and unathletic isn't great but you know, the production is there. I don't think he falls all too far because of a four seven four. But for me, for fantasy purposes, we've seen that athleticism has a big correlation to success. So he's somebody I cooled off on a bit and I moved Albert Okwagbunam ahead of him. I think I I think I hit that on the head. Yeah, I think overall it was it was kind of just like a disappointing showing for tight ends in general and kind of further solidified the thought that this tight end class wasn't maybe the, maybe it's deep in the sense that they will have some like solid NFL starters for the next whatever X amount of years. But there's nobody in the caliber of a TJ Hawkinson or a Noah fan or anything like that in this uh, in this class. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, speaking of Adam Troutman, I didn't put him on biggest risers or followers. I think he's kind of neutral. I think initially after he ran the he ran 40. the forty and came up with like a four point eight, we were like, uh shit. But but you know what? Uh he tested pretty decently on the burst score. And then on the agility side, he was like ninety fifth percentile. Like this guy was moving really quick in short spaces. And it kind of makes sense because I remember that clip you sent me, you know, uh, uh when you first uh watched Adam Troutman's like high school like back back room like black and white highlights no one, no one, knows knows Sasquatch footage. No, one no one forgets their first <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean it kind of makes sense that um he was able to do that and his best comp on player profiler is dallas goddard you know one of the former successes coming from a small school so you know Troutman kind of moved up a little bit for me just by function of the other guys moving down and we already really liked him so it's good to see him uh kind of perform well in the agility drills and hopefully the NFL team takes notice and gives him the proper draft capital he needs. Yeah, yeah you won't hear any bad words about Troutman from me. <laughs> I think that's a I think that's a brand uh, sentiment as well. Yeah, the four eight was a little bit concerning, but the fact that he kind of blew up in those other athletic areas tells you that he's he's versatile and he could do other things on the field rather than just like stretch the seam via beating a linebacker, which that exactly. still is like plenty fast enough to beat a linebacker. So yeah, and he's got a size the size, so it's gonna be good for him. Okay. Uh any any other followers you guys want to cover or before that we're gonna jump into our updated rankings. Uh one guy, Jawan Jennings. Uh I liked oh, him because yeah. of his broken oh, yeah. tackles and it looked like he was running backwards out there. So he's just off my rankings. He's gonna four seven three and he's like a fifth year senior. He's like Tommy boy. So he's <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not interested in him at all. Yeah. Yeah rest um, in peace. I would also like to just say again that Salvin Ahmed is just fucking. Like, <laughs> what so happened, man? So I'm much. Like, every... Matt Breida, and then he ran like Trent Richardson. It was. It made no, no sense. Dude, he's so bad. He was never good, and <laughs> he was never good, and he was never fast. And then he just also came into the combine and performed not good and not fast. So, dude, everyone thought he was going to run a four three. Man, I, I showed Noah this tweet. I forgot who it was, but someone. Someone thought there was going to be seven running backs in this class that was going to break 4-4. Four, four. Like, there were seven running backs that run 4-3s, which, one, goes to show that, dude, none of us know what the hell we're talking about when it comes to speed, which is I why do. we kind of we kind of have to rely on this. It's like we can't just be like, oh, yeah, like, oh, freaking JT, he ran a 4.39. Like, he's super fast, completely verifies what I saw on tape. And then, like, Salvin Ahmed runs, like, a 4-6. We're like, nah, man, dude, the tape says he runs fast. Tape never lies. Like, ignore the combine. You know what I mean? Just show me a something. small running back, and I'll hit on, on the head every time. Yeah. I'm two for two in this draft class. <laughs> All right. All right, cool. Um, we're gonna we're gonna put up our post combine rankings. Again, there's not gonna be like major changes, but we'll kind of highlight the ones that that have changed. Um, we'll throw up the quarterbacks real quick. No changes there. I mean, nothing in the combine either validated or showed anything like hand size. I mean, dick size doesn't matter. Joe Burrow is still the consensus BDG QB one, followed by Tua Tagovailoa, who is my QB1 and, in my opinion, the best prospect since uh, Andrew Luck. I'll convince you guys of that over the course of the next two months. And then number three, Justin Herbert. Uh, he's 6'6". Six, talking six. to your mic. He's 6'6". Six, six. Yeah, like an ice cream. So, uh, so you know that uh, John Elway is going to be all over that body, right? Um, and then number four, Jordan Love. Big hands. Noah loves him. 
And then finally, Jalen Hurts, who actually tested really well at the at the combine. So you know, hopefully, we're gonna see some some stock boost for him uh, instead of just a bunch of teams asking him to play wide receiver, which I'm sure <laughs> is what he's probably dealing with the most right now. So yeah, no changes there on the QB rankings. So There's we'll one talk. change for me. I think Jake Fromm just like can't be in the NFL. That dude no. is so bad. <laughs> oh my yeah. god. Oh yeah. We want to yeah, talk dude. about losers, Jake Fromm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's going to be like fucking, I don't know. He's like Tim Tebow. He's already in like, he's already a model and already out of the NFL. Get him <laughs> off. Like Los Angeles field. Rams, Case Keenum. He's like one of the worst quarterbacks I've ever seen. They were running like two yard slants and he was just like throwing it like it was a back shoulder <laughs> fade. Like, I don't understand how you pride your game on short plays and then you're out there in shorts and you're just throwing the ball around. So I, yeah, he just didn't look good. He wasn't fast. He's not going to give you any type of fantasy value. So. Yeah, yeah the funniest uh, thing was when uh, he went out there and it was like Brandon Ayuk's first route and uh, Jake, Jake Fromm overthrows him. And uh, Daniel Jeremiah is on air and just like, yeah, that's uh, Jake Fromm. And uh, we're not going to see him over. We're not going to be seeing him underthrowing anyone in these drills because it's all <laughs> everybody hates on him for. Yeah, he He's stinks. so fucking bad. Yeah, Jake Fromm, yeah. It just completely get him off your draft board. Super flex leagues or not. Yeah, we're yeah. talking to the NFL too. Like, just get him off your draft board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, that's up for QBs. Running backs, we're going to throw them up right here. I'm going to read them off um, for those of you on the podcast. RB1, still DeAndre Swift. Running back two, Jonathan Taylor. Running back three, Cam Akers. Followed by J.K. Dobbins and Clyde Edwards-Alaire. So no changes there. But we do have a new face. Big Dog's favorite, Antonio 4.39. Formerly wide receiver, now hopefully running back. Gibson we're gonna will him into that position yeah so it's a big jump for him but honestly we actually had him uh within our top 10 running backs already but had moved him to the wide moved him out because he wasn't designated as a running back I think you know all the buzz is gonna be that he is a running back so we decided to move him back in so he's gonna be our running back six and really the top of that tier right I mean he's a big guy 220 uh 220 230 like Running a 4.39 is incredibly impressive. We talked about his explosive playmaking ability. This guy's averaging 15 yards per touch. Like, just I can't even I can't even comprehend that number. Dude, um, 71 touches. The guy had over 1,100 yards from scrimmage. Like, I don't. It makes no fucking sense whatsoever. I think he's gonna get. I mean, he'll get the draft capital second or third round after this fucking combine. And then if a team gives him that draft capital, they're gonna give him a chance to to at least compete for the backfield spot. And if he's competing for the starting running back job. There's not an NFL running back that could probably beat him in that. Yeah, like three years ago, Ty Montgomery was seen as a consensus, like top 10 running back because he had a similar skill set. Antonio Gibson is Ty Montgomery on steroids. Hopefully he doesn't get suspended for that. But like, he's just so versatile. He's used in the kick return game, in the receiving game, in the running game. Uh, Yeah, he's very efficient in yards after contact, broken tackles and all that stuff. So if the draft capital is there and somebody wants to use him in a versatile role or out of the backfield, yeah, he's going to be a huge value. Yeah, what do you guys think? Like, I... I mean, I'm not sure if he'll go in the second or third round. I hope he does. Um, I think, I, think does. A, I think a pretty realistic scenario, though, is like he goes in the fourth round, you know, kind of similar to former, former running back mate Tony Pollard last year, like early fourth. And, you know, he goes to like a, back, a, a split backfield. Like let's say he goes to, I don't know, I guess San Francisco 49ers don't have a pick in the fourth round. But if they did, like if he went to the San Francisco 49ers as a fourth round draft pick, like what, what do you guys think about him? He'd probably move ahead of CEH for me. I think he might move into like that tier two just because, you know, that skill set is incredible. And in that offense, Kyle Shanahan just knows how to make running backs work. Uh, if he uses him as a pure running back, that'd be dangerous. It'd basically be what he brought Jarek McKinnon in there to do. I can't like, I can't imagine him going in the fourth round. Like what, what about any of his production or his, his testing or whatever puts him outside of the top three rounds? Um, if he does fall into the fourth round, that would be fucking miserable. But I, I just think he's one of those not can't miss prospects but someone that like is if he gets the chance he's going to succeed in that in that role so he's someone that if he goes outside you know normally for for rookie drafts like the first guys off the board need to always be day one or day two picks if you're starting to take fourth fifth round players anywhere inside the first two rounds of your rookie drafts you're doing this wrong but Gibson is a guy that I could see if he goes fourth round anything past fourth round obviously not but if he goes fourth round and it's a, to a, a decent situation I could see myself dipping into the second round for him yeah, I just think it's, you know, when you get guys like this where, like, you know, you're, tra- you're changing positions, like, I, I, you, I don't I, – I have to probably do a study, but, like, how, how, how often do you see a guy, like, changing position and getting, like, incredibly high draft capital on that, like, converted position that he, like, doesn't really have that much experience doing? I, yeah, I could see gonna, that's, like – that's the only knock that I could see someone having on him. I'm not saying that's my knock, but 
if an NFL team, like that could be one of the questions. It, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to need to be a team that is like, no, we're going to use him as a running back, you know? I don't want to see him like be a fucking wide receiver. No one wants to see him just no. act as a wide receiver in the NFL. Like put him in no. a backfield, let him dominate, and let me draft him. Yeah. Okay. RB7, Keyshawn Vaughn. You know, he kind of went in there, did his thing, didn't really move up, move much for us. Um, he kind of just moved a little bit just because of uh, Zach Moss falling down. And then number eight, another big riser. We covered him, uh, AJ Dillon. And, you know, it's kind of just hard to ignore what he, the show that he put on. And, and as an indicator of like where he might get drafted, like similar to how you said, like you don't see Antonio Gibson falling out of the first three rounds. Like I just don't really see AJ Dillon, AJ Dillon falling out of the first three rounds either. Like, what do you guys think? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Like people weigh the combine so heavily that, you know, he was a, like a very good producer okay, at Dillon. Boston college and he's, <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, but I'm assuming it was funny. Uh, AJ Dillon <laughs> produced in college. He's athletic. Yeah. He's not going to fall out of the first three rounds. Uh, people seem to love fat running backs, especially after seeing what Derrick Henry did this year. So yeah, he's going to be moving up draft boards. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and then next up, we covered him again. RB9, Anthony McFarland, Booger Son. Uh, we're just going to speak that into existence, by the way. We're just calling him Booger Son from now on. Um, he definitely kind of did a lot for his draft stock. So he was originally – he was my RB13, so just outside the top 12. So it wasn't like he made any massive leaps and bounds. And – you know, I think him showing up the combine at the weight that he did, running the 40 that he did, and being the playmaker that he is, you know, kind of did make him jump up a little bit. And then next up, our I'm biggest not, baller. I'm not jumping in there. <laughs> yeah, I just want to give <laughs> you a chance. We already talked about McFarland. I want to give you a chance to talk about Let's your go. Movie. Next up, uh, biggest faller. Again, we covered him. Zach Moss. I mean, 4.65. You absolutely hate to see it. And Michael Jordan memes and everything. <laughs> we, we're going to really, really, really going to hope that he kind of redeems himself um, on his pro day. And, like, I think the thing with Zach Moss that I was, like, having a tr- trouble getting across is, like, when he ran a 6.5, I was like, oh, like, I'm not really that surprised. Like, that's kind of what, what I expected him to run at. Um, and I think that's kind of the view that a lot of teams have. So, hopefully he redeems himself. If he doesn't, I, we're going to have trouble, you know, taking him in within the first two rounds. I think you guys should probably have caution as well. Uh, RB11, you know, Benjamin, kind of someone that was, you know, split in the dynasty community he came in super light in senior bowl because he said he wanted to run faster went in there i mean didn't really run that great but you know put up a sub four six so he's better than we could say for zach moss um did decent on the burst drills uh what what do you guys think about you know benjamin like i know like he's pretty split in the community like i think uh, i just don't know what to say about him i i think the best thing that um that I've seen so far is the is the player profiler comp of Duke Johnson it's like a yeah. guy that uh, so many people love they just like want something good to happen and he's just going to continue to show us glimpses of it for like eight years and it's never really going to be all put together um but that being said when you have that there's about 52 different trade opportunities that you'll have with a guy like Duke Johnson throughout his career so you know uh you know a guy that I, I liked man I, I liked on the tape um obviously he's nowhere near where like some of the hype on him has gotten because he I mean he's put up some like really crazy prolific uh stats and numbers in college before but I, I think he'll be a good piece for an NFL team and I think he'll definitely provide you some decent fantasy value so if everyone kind of gets so down on him to the point where like you're getting him at a good value I'll be happy to to grab you know yeah and he's got that three down skill set he was a very good pass catcher in college the one knock and I know we've talked about it is his vision and it's not that like he runs into his offensive line all the time. It's like he looks for contact at the second level. There was one play I saw where like he was just had a free ride into the end zone and he just ran into a defender and then got, got like all up in his face. I don't see how that's going to help him at any point <laughs> in the next level. But, you know, he's very elusive. He has the hands. Draft, cap- draft capital, if it's there, I could see him taking on like a Devin Singletary type of rookie role where he's not a main guy, but he can be decently uh, relevant for fantasy. Probably a better pass catcher than Singletary was coming out of college. But yeah, he's not somebody I have in the first two tiers, but he's somebody that could jump up based on draft capital. And he tested fairly well, and he came in uh, at a heavier weight than we expected, especially after the senior bowl being like 192 pounds. Yeah, the yeah, burst dude. score was good to see. Burst and agility were up there too, so those are ways he can make up for not having you know, necessarily the long speed. Yeah, exactly. So be on the lookout for him. I think he's going to be someone you can definitely grab in like that mid to later second round, mm-hmm. second round range. So at that value, I think he's a pretty good shot. And to round out our top 12 running backs – Darrington Evans actually had a pretty pretty nice combine himself. I mean, ran a low four four, 
Problem is, you know, he's come from a small school, is a smaller dude, but he is super versatile. So, again, this is just another one of those guys you can look out for um, late in the second round, maybe even early in the third round, if he, like, lands somewhere. Again, if he goes, like, sixth round later, just please take him off your draft board because he's just not going to get the opportunity to ever show it. Um, but if he gets taken in the fourth round, you know, and gets gets into, like, a creative backfield where they can use him as a, as a weapon, could definitely be uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, yep. to me, his ceiling is like Philip Lindsay. He's like that same mold. He has the same speed. Uh, Colorado is obviously a bigger school than Appalachian State, but, you know, produced at the collegiate level and he proved to be a workhorse. I'm not sure that's going to be able to hold up at his size at the next level with, you know, a pretty slight BMI. But, you know, he's somebody that definitely has juice and he proved that at the combine. So, yeah, he's somebody that I like as a potential player that can stick around because of special team contributions. And maybe if his name is called, he can produce for you for your fantasy team. Yep. Moving on, wide receiver rankings. Again, we'll be on the screen. I'm just going to read them out for the viewers who are listening in through the podcast. Wide receiver one, C.D. Lamb. No surprises. He went out there, performed pretty damn well at the Combine. Uh, wide receiver two, Jalen Rager. Ran a bit slower, but, man, that 99th percentile burst is exactly what we want to see at the wide receiver position. Number three, Jerry Judy. And then number four, we now have Justin Jefferson. Um, and, again, that's more of a function of the other guys moving down because they didn't really show anything versus Justin Jefferson just moving up because he – Yeah, I, I would like to jump in there and say, like, I, we like Justin Jefferson, but by no means is he even close to that top tier. In yeah, he's in the second tier for yeah. us. That's the tier break. Yeah. Um, and then number five, top five wide receiver, Denzel Mims from Baylor. Uh, again, just someone that we already love coming into the combine, absolutely exploded on the combine and, you know, just draft stock. So number six, Titty Higgins, love my boy. These guys hate him. I don't know why I'll try and convert him over the course of the next couple months. <laughs> uh, wide receiver seven, Brian Edwards, wide receiver eight, Henry Ruggs, wide receiver nine, LaVisca Cheneau. We talked about his injury. And then the last three, Tyler Johnson, KJ Hamler, and Lynn Bowden kind of just stayed the same um, from where we were before the combine. I'm Anything... surprised that you guys had – I'm surprised you guys kept Brian Edwards up there above Ruggs. Yeah, I mean, like Edwards is someone that – like we've actually clocked – I think someone clocked his game speed. So we like for me, I feel like I know the athleticism is there and the size is there, the production's there, um, the analytics are there. So like I'm hoping that a team takes a shot on him. Um, that's kind of what I'm holding on to. If he gets drafted like within the first three rounds, I'm still all about Ryan Edwards. So it's hard for me to move Ruggs above him because like I knew Ruggs was going to be fast. So it didn't really change much for me. Yeah, yeah for me, I, like I Ruggs is inevitably, inevitably going to move ahead of a bunch of these guys because he's going to be like a top 15 pick. If he lands in Philly, it's going to be hard for me to keep him outside of my top five. But for right now, everything that I've seen from Edwards, right, we couldn't make a knock on him from the combine because he was physically unable to perform. But his analytics profile, what I saw on tape, I really liked. Uh, his foot injury, I guess, is only supposed to last like four to six months. So I don't think a lot of time is going to be lost in training camp when he gets drafted to a new team. But yeah, if Ruggs gets that draft capital, which everybody thinks he will, and Edwards falls to round two or round three, yeah, he's probably going to move ahead of him. I just want to leave Ruggs as low as I can for as long as possible. <laughs> That's a rough timetable, though. Four to six months? That puts him like... Uh, four is. to six weeks. Oh, yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, four to six, six months. Like, I'm like, he's off my fucking board in the first round or anywhere near <laughs> there if he is. I just, yeah, uh, I don't know. Ruggs just seems like he's definitely more of a going to move drastically depending on the NFL draft and where he ends up landing. The other thing I surprised you that we kept Tyler Johnson in the top 10. I just think that, like, him not competing at the combine, plus the fact that, like, all we're hearing is that NFL doesn't really like him that much. He's probably going to be like a day four or a, a round four or five guy. Um, I don't know. Like, if you're drafting, if you're drafting today, like, some people have their rookie draft before the NFL draft. Like, if you're drafting today, is Tyler Johnson really the wide receiver 10? I mean, he That'd still is for me. He still is for me because, like, when you get to that range, I think what you're weighing is, like, you're trying to weight their production. And, like, at least for me, you're trying to weight their production, like, analytics profile against, like, against the draft capital a bit. Um, I mean, like, look, it's really hard because draft capital, to me, like, for, for running backs, it's, like, absolutely everything right like because that's how you get on the field yeah. and for running backs talent like honestly doesn't move the needle as much as opportunity no it's like when but, you're averaging 4.3 yards a carry against 4.7 like the only thing that matters is tons of volume yeah exactly but like for wide receivers like it, it, you, you want to see them go in the first two rounds but it's not like a absolute death sentence right if you get drafted in like the fourth or fifth round like we've seen guys like like yeah. Diggs, for example and and others Darius that have Slayton last year had yeah a good year so, sure. so for me, like, it just comes down, comes down to that, you know, and 
look, I mean, who are you, who are you, I guess who are you going to move ahead of him, right? I guess we talked about some of them, like like Michael Pittman Jr. and there, maybe like yeah. Brandon Ayuk. Um, like those guys, like that cluster of tiers is just like, it's so close to me that I'm just going to bank more on my analytical and what I've seen up until now. Um, yeah, also coming like off said, the combine, it's like you, you know, you get excited about the guys that competed at the combine. So it's just like this natural lack, <laughs> this natural tech, like move the guys who didn't compete down. She was like, oh, we just saw these guys and they excited me. So we're going to just jump them over yeah. these guys who uh, we haven't seen anything from in a while. So I guess yeah. maybe that's part of it too. And we talked about like, you know, look, it only takes one stupid team to like overvalue Agent Dillon, but also only takes like one smart team to actually like value the proper traits that someone like Tyler Johnson displays. So as long as, long well, as they're a guy you like, that it's a smart team doing it. If it's a guy you don't <laughs> like, then the team just has to be as dumb to do Dude, it. Those are the facts. Those are the facts. You can't argue with those facts, guys. You lay them out, baby. Okay. Um, last up, tight end rankings. Throw them up on the board. Tight end one, Trout God. Uh, I've kind of moved to basically move him up as well just because of the reasons we talked about. Uh, number two, we still have Harrison Bryant there, just given how he is as a pass catcher. Number three, Big Al. Number four, Hunter Bryant. And last round of the top five is Cole Komet. Not going to spend too much time talking here. I mean, we already talked about the speed demon, Big Al. But, you know, it's really going to be important to see what draft capital comes out for some of these guys. And honestly, like, you're not going to be trying to invest, like, top two round capital on most of these guys anyways, right? Like, if you were me or – like, if it's not a tight end premium, like, where are you guys going to take the first tight end? Yeah, probably. probably. They would, yeah, it would completely depend on draft capital. But I don't imagine, just knowing what we know now, that anyone's going to creep into the, mid, like, top 15 or 18 picks within a rookie draft. So it's definitely, like, back end of the – Second round, I'll probably be looking to target some of these guys because I, for some reason, whenever I do dynasty startups, I end up not really going too hard on tight ends. So I need to usually develop them through the rookie drafts. And this will be a, a class that I probably take a stab at a couple of these guys. Um, generally, though, yeah, again, it's kind of a weak class. And with tight ends, I just, I don't know. It, like, we talked about this via text. Like, it's so fucking hard to project quarterbacks and tight ends. Like, NFL teams get them wrong so much. And all they do for these last fucking six months is try to project what these guys are going to do. And all they do is swing and miss. So for us, it's just like, there's only a couple cool. data points that we can kind of go off of. Right. And I'll let the draft capital do the talking. I'm not going to like sit here and pretend to know that, you know, tight ends, I know what we're supposed to be looking for, quarterbacks and shit. So um, with that, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for the NFL draft to, to really change my rankings on things. Yeah, it yeah. takes so long for them to break out anyways. Even the athletic guys like Jonu Smith, we're just now seeing him kind of cement a role for himself in Tennessee. So if you just want to pass on the position as a whole and buy after the rookie year, like you could have done with TJ Hawkinson this year, that's something that I'm not opposed to because – as we said, this isn't like a talent-rich class. The fact that Albert O moved up as far as he did solely because he ran fast for 40 yards speaks to this class not being, you know, what it was in 2000, uh, the 2019 class with Hawkinson, with Noah Fant, uh, Sternberg, or who else. So, yeah, I honestly maybe just passing all these guys unless it's a tight end premium and you're shallow at, at the position. But I know next year you can probably acquire Troutman for a third-round rookie pick. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, boys, that rounds up the Big Dog ranks. Um, again, make sure you cop your Big Dog's draft guide, Big Dog's draft guide, vdgdraftguide.com. And, you know, we're going to have all the stuff in there. We're going to have rankings, which are updating, you know, periodically. We're going to have all the in-player breakdowns. We're going to have probably some videos too, as well as mock drafts. So everything you want to win your Dynasty Leagues, it's going to be in that guide. So make sure you guys cop that. I agree. I think people should buy it. It's the best value. The best it's value. It's, it's the 1.01. It's past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, before we close out here, we're going to hit up the narrative this week. The narrative this week, comically, is that the combine doesn't matter. Um, we saw a lot of this stuff on Twitter. You know, people saying like 40s don't matter. You know, cones don't matter. Broad jumps don't matter. And you look, look, here's our take on it. You know, we came back last night, last time and told you guys like, look, the combine is not something you should wait too heavily. But again, it's a, it's a litmus test for what you think and what we think the uh, combine will do to their draft stock. So I think that's like the best way to frame it is like, if someone goes and shits the bed in the combine, like it's not good for the draft stock. Like, you don't need the combine to do good, but if you do really poorly, it becomes really hard to do good. I think that's probably the way I think about it. Yeah, me personally, I'm a fraud. I told people not to care about the combine. And then you see my rankings move around like crazy. So tweet at me, FB fraud. I won't even be, you know, I'll take it on the chin. But yeah, as Mike said, like it has more to do with real life. Over bottom. <laughs> no, no way. I'm going to be top on this video. Uh, 
<laughs> it has more to do with like the, imp- the pending draft capital, in my opinion. Like a guy like Zach Moss might have fallen around where a guy like you know Cam Akers could have shot up around an intern that makes them better fantasy weapons because they have more opportunity early on. So yeah, just the difference between like a four four seven and a four five zero in real life is nothing. But when you see it on paper, it's huge. In that sense, I don't weigh it so heavily. But when you take into consideration the impact it has in real life, uh, and then in turn on your fantasy team, then yeah, you should definitely weigh it fairly heavily. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't I have. About to go to sleep. I think it's time. I was going to say when you want to when you want to die, nothing really matters anyway. <laughs> No, the uh, combine is um, very good to give NFL teams uh, a dumb reason to draft players in in random spots. So it, it's again, we'll 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 echo the sentiment until the NFL draft is done. But draft capital is just so important compared to what the athletics of a, of a certain player are because it's they're just going to fit them into whatever role they want to. At the yeah, end, how, the how much do you guys? I was thinking about this the other day. Like, you know, people run like correlation studies on like what matters most and, you know, 40 yard dashes and speed scores matter the most for running backs. Like I was thinking like how much of that is like, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy of just like guys getting drafted earlier because they have like a 40 yard score, you know, like we've seen guys with low 40 scores succeed. We've seen like Kareem Hunt, Lev Bells, Arian Fosters, you know, all these guys that have gone in the NFL and produced at a prolific level. Um, And, you know, I just think like, I mean, there's really no way to test it, but it kind of sucks that, you know, a lot of these guys just are not going to get the opportunity because, you know, they didn't run a fast 40 in a straight line. Which you Well, really I feel do. like the best thing would be to cross-reference the running backs that have performed poorly at the combine but still went in the first or second round and see how they stacked up against the top-tier guys. I would still say, though, the athletics are probably the ones who – the more athletic guys are the ones who absolutely dominate in real the NFL. I mean, like – Look at fucking like Saquon and C Mac and Leonard Fournette and shit. Like those are the guys who put up numbers, but they're also extremely athletic. Um, but and then again, you look at like Josh Jacobs, who wasn't first round, yeah. performed very well. And I'm sure there are plenty of other guys that went the first, uh, second round that weren't good athletically. But you have like guys like uh, Ronald Jones, who yeah. went early second round, right about right around when Nick Chubb did. Look at the, the difference between the two. Of course, yeah. like we're never going to be able to actually figure it out because there's so many moving parts and different teams and situations and shit. But I, I would say that. Um, if you put the less athletic guys into the draft capital of where the athletic guys go, you'd probably see a fall off in production. Yeah. I guess it's hard to say that bigger and be- uh, faster isn't better, but you know, maybe the discrepancy isn't as big as it's made out to be just to get yeah. that stuff. But, but yeah, that's all we got for you guys, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I don't even know how long this one ran for, but uh, Nick's ready for bed. So one hour, 13 we're, minutes we're, and 14 seconds. We're going to tuck him in, uh, in his bandana and everything. Thanks for tuning in, boys. See you guys next week. Hit that thumbs up. We love you. Boom. You should have left the last one in when I yelled at you. <laughs> I put it at the very end of the video. Oh, really? I didn't see it. Yeah, I've been putting like the the outtakes when I choke up. <laughs> All right, you ready? Hit it. What's fuck? <laughs> well, I heard you like take a breath in, like you had to fucking get, get energized. <laughs> I, had to. I need to like flip a switch. All right. I just want to go on the record and say it's ridiculous that I don't even get a piece in the intro anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even like get to say hi to the fucking audience. We just skip over <laughs> me. No, just fucking, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm going to shut um, this fucking show down. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi.